Today's guest is John Etchemendy of Stanford University. John is the Patrick Supps Family Professor in the Stanford School of Humanities and Sciences, and he's co-director of Stanford's Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. He was Stanford's 12th and longest-serving provost almost 17 years, which, of course, as you would imagine, is among the longest in any research university. Uh, he currently is a professor of philosophy and symbolic systems. His book, The Concept of Logical Consequence, deals with issues of truth and alternative interpretations. Language Proof and Logic is a widely used introductory text and logic of his, as was one of the first open source textbooks in any field. He also developed Hyperproof, which is an online system for grading logical proofs, the first system widely available for grading complex work. John holds many honors and awards, including uh, being elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. In his 35 years as a Stanford faculty member, John has also served as director of the Center for Language and Information Studies, chair of the philosophy department, and senior associate dean for the School of Humanities and Science. He earned his undergrad and master's degrees in philosophy from the University of Nevada, Reno, and his PhD from uh, Stanford. John, welcome. Thanks, Scott. Thank you very much for being here. There's so many things to talk about. Uh, I don't have to tell you, but the universities are the center of a lot of attention these days. Uh, and we'll, we'll sort of get into it with my, uh, my introduction, which is my take, and I think we would all agree on this, that universities are granted privileged positions in our society. They're very important. University professors, uh, rather automatically by virtue of their titles, uh, are the sources of experts for the media. They're uh, deemed experts by the public. They're selected as advisors to government leaders, as directors of government agencies. Uh, and they are not only recipients of billions of dollars of taxpayer funding of research, but they are also trusted uh, generally to determine who receives that funding. Uh, in all their roles, uh, my view is their most important role is that we trust them to teach our children critical thinking and to really serve as important role models. So with that sort of lengthy uh, premise... How do you think universities and professors are doing these days? It's a setup, Scott. <laughs> I mean, in honesty, I think we're not doing very well. Uh, in, in, and I, I emphasize that. So, you know, when I stepped down as provost, which is about six years ago now, I, I wrote a piece that um, said, at that point I had been observing the past few years, uh, the growing homogenization of the university, both political, but even in, along non-political dimensions. And uh, the piece was titled The Threat Within, and basically said that, look, this is, the, this is the greatest threat to the functioning of the universities. It's not the political opinions uh, you know, of the senators or the funding uh, agencies. And I have to say that I now, six years later, I could not have believed at that time how much worse it would, would, would get in a, in a very short period of time. And let me, let me try to explain what I think is going on. Okay. Uh, so there's a, there's a natural tendency toward homogenization within individual departments because we hire our colleagues. So, you know, obviously the philosophy department chooses new philosophy colleagues and physics department chooses new sure. physics. And, and there's a tendency to uh, hire people that think the same way you do. And that's a very human, for very human reasons. You know, if, if you have a, a job candidate that comes and gives a talk, their conclusion, if their conclusion agrees with you, you know, you think, oh, what a smart person. Sure, think, it's a self-affirmation. You know, right, exactly. Whereas if, if it disagrees with your core beliefs or something that you feel very strongly about, 
you find the error in their argument. You find, you know, what kind of data did they have? Was what was the methodology adequate, and so forth and so on. And we can always find, we can almost always find flaws. And so, of course, you have this tendency within a department to become more homogeneous in your in your views. Now, that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with politics. Politics exactly. Like, you know, you can have different departments going. It's path dependent. You can have different departments going different directions. So you have the Chicago Economics Department, and it has a particular uh, cast, a, a particular uh, outlook. And, and, then and you of course, the, of many many disciplines are, are in theory completely apolitical. They have nothing to do with politics. Exactly. Exactly. But that doesn't mean that they don't become homogeneous within a, you know, so I think a good example is physics and dark matter. And the, it turns out that, you know, there's very little evidence for dark matter. Everybody's absolutely convinced it's got to be there. And and this is this becomes a dogma. And that builds on itself. In any event, so, so there's that tendency. That tendency is, I don't think that's a really seriously harmful tendency because as long as you have divergence within the overall discipline. You can have the kind of dialogue that you need to keep science going. But then the second thing that happens, and this is this has been happening increasingly, is advocacy. Right. When when uh, a scientist, I'll, I'll talk about scientists, I don't mean just scientists, or social science. Sure. Um, when, when you begin to think of your role as a role of advocate to not other people in your discipline, but to the public, the general public, or to the to the politicians, that can be harmful to science. The reason it can be harmful to science is that, uh, first of all, it locks you into a petition that you feel you then have to defend. Secondly, there's a tendency to want to simplify everything. I want to convince this congressman. I want to convince this general public that this is the right thing to do in a policy realm, say, and say, you know, climate change. Uh, there's a tendency then to really hide, try, oversimplify, and pretend that this conclusion is clear. All of all scientists believe this. You know, the science is settled. The false consensus. Yeah, exactly. The science is never settled. So as soon as you hear somebody say the science is settled, you should discount that person. I, I, I think that, uh, well, I, I won't go into any sure, particular. Sure, we, we don't have to. We, we know what settled science and the debates about it are. Uh, you know, I wonder, is this advocacy something that, uh, it certainly seems stronger these days uh, <laughs> than it used to be. I mean, we both have some gray hair, so we, we've been around for a bit. Uh, and I wonder, given that, I think we would agree that it is more a prominent, more prominent, a feature of, of, of university professoriates. Uh, why is that? And, uh, the second part of that question is, you know, that I've heard a university welcoming speeches to students say, we want students to be advocates. And I'm wondering where that uh, is that appropriate or where does that lead well you know i i'm happy to say that students we want to educate students as as well as we can and send them off into the world to do good sure you know that's fine uh and so that's not what i'm objecting to what i'm objecting to is as qua scientist as scientist do you are you committed first and foremost, to the truth, to finding out what's true, to understanding the world, or are you committed first and foremost to changing the world, right? And I think what has happened is more and more universities have begun to see their role as a role of changing the world rather than understanding the world. And and that's something that's fairly new. I think that's... Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly and, in fields that are not 
you know, I, I look at I look at this. Okay, so I've been in uh, health policy for more than a decade full time. I started off in medicine. Uh, when I was in medicine, my role was to be the best doctor that I could in my area of expertise. Uh, and of course, I was an educator and a researcher being in an academic job. But uh, when you're in policy, you're supposed to be working on designing policy. Uh, it seems like everybody is intent on changing policy these days. And this is where this what you're talking about, this so-called advocacy uh, gets gets a little bit tricky because uh it, it doesn't see it there there's of course everything is applied uh except if you talk to a theoretical physicist uh, but in general you know uh, that seems to be uh an editorialization or almost a, not a perversion but an alteration in the goal of seeking truth for the for the sake of the of the research so so policy is you know I, i'm not saying that People shouldn't be doing policy or right. people shouldn't be thinking about policy. They absolutely should be. But uh, that's not that's not uh, your role as a scientist. So you were in radiology, is that right? Yeah, I was in neuroscience and, and yeah, radiology and neuro okay. specifically. So your your science, you know, I don't I don't know your fields, but should not be uh, affected first and foremost by by policy a policy agenda absolutely and it should be affected by wanting to find out the truth about whatever the question is that you're addressing and um then we do want people with expertise to enter into the policy realm but when you enter into the policy realm for one thing it's a far more complex realm than than the science in the sense that it requires, I mean, as you know very well, the policies, for example, with the pandemic, um, the the truth, the immunologists didn't have the whole answer. You have to ask economists. You have to ask, you know, education specialists. You have there. There's a far greater realm of expertise or Absolutely. range of expertise that has to go into uh, coming up with the right, right. policy. Right, and that's why pol that's what policy is. Policy is, uh, you don't want policy. Uh, uh, let's put it this way. I wouldn't want a, a basic scientist or an epidemiologist or a virologist or a cardiac surgeon to devise policy. You want somebody who has expertise in these areas but like you're saying, there's a lot more to policy, uh, and w there was no better illustration, of course, than the pandemic management. Yeah, uh, yeah. and that was missing, uh, uh, frankly. Uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Okay, your so let me, let me let me go to the final thing, the final step. So I said advocacy. Now, there's nothing about advocacy that is necessarily political. You can you can imagine both Democrats and Republicans advocating for for a similar position or, or disagree. Um, but the polit then the next step is when positions in academia or academic positions, scientific positions, becoming political. Right. And political, what I mean by political is, is specifically... Partisan uh, politics. Partisan policies, exactly. Right. And, and, then, and that is a very, very strange thing to happen Um in some cases, so let's take the pandemic. So, as, as you know well, uh, the the view about mask mandates became very political. Well, maybe you can understand why. You know, the Republicans are maybe more in favor of, you know, individual freedom. Uh, the Democrats are more willing to to impose government, you know, government control. So maybe there's a reason for that becoming political political, but everything else did too. So for example, the question of the infection fatality rate became political. Uh, it was, uh, uh, Democrats didn't want it to be as low as it in fact was. <laughs> yeah. He, he, and this is, this is a real, I, I, I would like to just sort of interrupt and say, 
this is a real problem of uh, that I, that I I couldn't really and still am frustrated with. I couldn't get a handle on which was two things. Number one, people who were political saw everyone who was saying something different from them as being political, uh, whereas uh, it is not true that public policy is necessarily at all political. In fact, you know, I know it isn't from my own personal, uh, you know, work. Uh, you know, I, I, I never had any idea that I was even entering a, a politicized role when I was asked to help. I thought, well, people are dying. Uh, it's my country. Uh, if you think the president's incompetent, you better say yes. Uh, well, it had nothing to do with politics. Uh, yet anyone who was opposed to that administration seemed to accuse me and anyone who worked in that administration at all as being politically motivated. And that, to me, was a reflection of the people making the accusation. Uh, but the, the second part is that when you say things were, were politicized in the pandemic, I, I agree with you, but I still can't figure out, I, I still think it's wrong to have done that for people who did that. I still think it's it's not really legitimate to uh, politicize the data on mask wearing, even something that was so highly charged. But, but they did. You're right, they did. Yeah, Scott, I'm not saying, I, I'm not. No, I know, yeah. I'm not saying it was by nature political. Right. I, mean, I agree with you. I think many of these questions, there's absolutely no reason that there should be a political divide. You know, where what was the source of the, of the virus? Was mm -hmm. it a lab leak or was it, you know, there's no reason in the world that that should divide should by Paul. And yeah, wh why did that happen? I mean, I, I have my own ideas. I'm wondering, what, what do you think it was? Was it just that we had such a radioactive president in certain people's eyes? Or what, what was it? Because it happened all over the world, by the way. Just it ignited here, I feel. But England, uh, UK had a lot of uh, politicization of things to some extent. And, you know, it became a very divisive issue everywhere. Yeah, I I think. I mean, are you asking specifically about the virus source? Well, question? no, no, no. I'm talking about just simply the entire pandemic itself, because I think a lot of the discussion we have about universities and what we see was accelerated. The divisiveness on university campuses was accelerated because of the pandemic. Yeah, and and it was there, but it was exposed more so because of the divided public on the pandemic. So yeah. I'm wondering yeah. what, why this uh, became so politicized. So uh, I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I think that part of it was um, that the reaction that many governments had to the pandemic uh, actually following on the Chinese reaction. So the Chinese did this very mm -hmm. typically top-down, uh, restrictive uh, shutdowns. And we began to emulate that. Not just, when I say we, I don't mean just the U.S. Right. I mean all, all over. Um, and I think that that, in some sense, there is a natural reason that that becomes political. You know, do you believe that the government should be allowed to restrict you to your house, force you to wear a mask, force you to have uh, a vaccine. Um, so by that, the very nature of the of the commandeering of the public, it has necessarily to be governmental if it's going to happen. Uh, therefore, it becomes political. That's true. So, so, that, so that part of it, I, I, I can see where the political motivation. On the other hand, the fact that we had uh, um, a, a president that at least half the country <laughs> hated, right, uh, and was was added to this, right. So any anything that seems to support either uh, a policy that that he was supporting w was seen as bad, and so the Democrats had to oppose that. And when I say Democrats, as you know, that means most of academia. Mm -hmm. Because here's the problem to me was that. It's understandable that people in a general sense, in a very divided country politically, are going to be politically uh, active in terms of their opinion, politically motivated. But what happened, uh, in, in my opinion, was that, and this was all over the country, 
was that the political uh, sort of view, the lens, became very overt on university campuses. And uh, here, wearing university hats on university stationery in university positions, where we are very important role models for for children, for young people. And I, I take that and the sort of way you teach critical thinking as the most important role of a university because, you know, everybody can basically look up information. That's not the issue here. It's how to think. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to teach people how to think. In my view is that that was a huge failure by the universities in the professoriates in general. Well, of course, I'm making a broad statement. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree that it was. And the pandemic, I think the pandemic and what happened at universities, but also within the society, uh, was really, I guess, horrendous. I mean, it was a, it was a huge disconnect and a, a, an an accentuation of the bad tendencies that had been building already. I mean, I actually think that um, we we saw it before, okay. but but the pandemic really did bring it to a four um, or to the four. What, so what do you- I think, for example, um, that the the way that climate change is being treated at universities is not different in kind from what happened during the pandemic. Maybe it's different in, uh, I don't know, intensity, but I don't know about that. Um, I think I, that- I agree with you. I, it's be, and it's being viewed in, in, if this is what you're saying, I think it's true, which is it's being treated or almost sort of nuanced in political terms by university faculty, by scientists. Uh, the discussion is sort of advocacy based by basic scientists. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, I think we're headed down that pathway. We're already partly down that same pathway. Uh, and again, because the university scientists are the advisors to governments and taken as experts and put on TV as the so-called talking heads, uh, we're, we're, I think, accelerating into that, that very uh, polarized world again. You know, Scott, when you think about it, uh, going back five, six years, e- even as, as little as five or six years, you would never have found uh, a climate scientist do individual event attribution. Point to a hurricane and say, that was 10% stronger or 20% stronger because of climate change. That was just not done. What was done was, you know, as the, as the climate warms, we're going to see more and more of this kind of, you know, intense storm, um, but not an individual attribution and say right. that hurricane was... Be- because and, that's just not good science. I mean, it, it really, right. you know, everybody knows that. So, and yet now... You can't avoid that. There, even even legitimate scientists are now doing individual event attribution. Mm-hmm. Saying, Look, this is this is being caused by, or this is partially caused by, uh, uh, you know, climate change, and and the science that that's based on is is very very tenuous. Right, very tenuous. Uh, but why are they doing that? They're doing that because they're advocates. They're doing that because they want to communicate to the general public. You've got to pay attention. So look at that. Look at what just happened. Now look at that flood. That was caused by climate change. But why? That's- why is this happening? Though I, I still, I, and I know we don't really. Ha- no one has the answer to why. But this is a change. This is not. At least we weren't aware of it. I mean, I'm thinking back. Of course, twenty years ago. 30 years ago, it didn't seem to be part of, uh, is this just a manifestation of a, of a more polarized country? Uh, is this because the faculties have gradually become 95% one party uh, politically? And uh, is it just sort of groupthink that is evolving because you're surrounding yourself with people who are thinking alike? 
Well, I, and I mean, I'm sure all of those are, are factors. Um, but I think it's also, um, you know, a decision on the part of at least some scientists that, uh, that they have to be, they have to overemphasize or they have to be more sure. They have to pretend they're more sure about what's, what's going on in order to convince the general public. Please, please. Now, this, this view, uh, I mean, you know, it's interesting. If you look at, if you read the IPCC reports, they, and, and I'm talking about not the summaries or the policy. Right. When you read the actual reports, they are much more cautious. I've seen that. Much more cautious. And, um, and they tend not to do individual attribution. And they tend to be very careful about saying, this is a, uh, you know, we have very low confidence in this conclusion. Um, but then when it gets to the summary stage and to the policy stage and to what then gets picked up in the press, um, all of that subtlety goes away. Now, some of that is just, frankly, the, the press. I mean, some of that is... I agree. Is, the, me the media has been very harmful in many ways in these kinds of debates. And, and now that we're in this era that we're in, as you know better than I do, uh, where everything is just you look it up and it's on the internet. Uh, with all that information came a very false confidence in the legitimacy of the information and the the value of the information, and sort of then it becomes hyperbole, hyperbole, which get which gets your message out, I guess. Right. Well, it gets your message out, and it gets it gets readership. Too. Yes. You know, um, the if it bleeds, it leads. That sort of attitude. Uh, I think that you know these kinds of stories are stories that at least at the at the moment uh, the press the media sees as gripping, sees as the sort of thing that is going to you know attract viewership, readership, whatever, um, and and so that's that's why they are so prominent. Mm -hmm. so, a, a, a subtle a subtle nuanced story is not going to get readership. <laughs> That's right. But again, the role of the university, and again, I am I may be idealistic about it, but the role of a scientist, the role of a, uh, of a true academician, particularly on campus, you can't, you can't do that, or you're, 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 you're doing a disservice to the students, first of all, which is your main audience, and you're really uh, sort of, you're diminishing your own value uh, because, you know, basically there's plenty of people that are going to be willing to exaggerate or to define things too clearly. So the question, though, is where how, how should universities uh, actively recruit people who have differing opinions into their departments? That's easier said than done, particularly since we know that... Uh, People have a tendency to be conformists uh, because they want to navigate their careers, uh, but also the faculty hiring committees uh, are not thrilled about that because we're all human beings, basically. Uh, you know, I, I just wonder how to how to fix that. Yeah, so I don't know how to get here, get there from here. Would we be better off if we were uh, more balanced, both politically and and sort of with a diversity of of academic opinion? The answer is obviously yes. Sure. That should be the goal. How do you get there? Uh, and, and there is where I, I am discouraged because it's hard to see, given the fact that uh, departments renew themselves, that is, departments hire you know, the, the new faculty and so yes. forth and so on, how do you, I mean, I'm, I don't believe in forcing it. I mean, I would. No. It would be horrible to say your next hire has to be uh, somebody with these views. Or absolutely, I couldn't agree more. But I do think uh, the universities have not lived up to their uh, their academic freedom statements. Uh, and what I mean by academic freedom, you know, as you know. Uh, the, the, there's a nuance to academic freedom. It has not 
It's not simply do you get fired or not. It, it's no, no. you know there's a tremendous amount of uh, potential for intimidation, uh, for uh, basically marginalizing people, for defaming, for lack of a better word, people for delegitimizing people. It's done all the time. It, you know, obviously it was done to me, um, and uh, these are contrary, directly contrary to the atmosphere stated in all of these campuses, universities, uh, academic freedom documents. <laughs> And so, but I, so I think in terms of forcing, of course, I, I do not think that anyone should be forced to hire anybody and we can get into that. I do want to touch on that in more obvious ways with these diversity issues. But, um, I do think diversity of thought is what the goal is of diversity. That's the whole goal of all these diversities. I think it's certainly one of them. And I do think that there's been a violation of the main role of a university as the center of the free exchange of ideas, because you can't have a free exchange of ideas if you're busy intimidating and harassing people, particularly younger professors. I mean, people like, uh, like myself, okay, there's a limit. I, 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 but generally speaking, nobody can intimidate me, but if I was an assistant professor, I, I, I'm not sure I would be able to say that. So, sure. how, you know, what, what do we do about forcing for lack of a better word or ensuring true uh freedom and the free exchange of ideas that we owe to our students frankly so that's a hard question and and i don't know exactly what the answer is i think that we 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 need to do that um i think it's it, it is so much driven by the culture and the um sort of the dominant opinion so if you you know if the university were to say, uh, say adopt the Chicago principles, right? So say, look, uh, we we don't fire people, we don't punish people for having a you know diverse opinions and for expressing them. Express whatever opinion you you, you please, um, but be prepared to defend it. Uh, that wouldn't solve the problem. That wouldn't solve the problem because it's the colleagues and the students and the pressure that comes from the the community that has such a big effect. Um, so, isn't it really a failure though of leadership? And what I mean by that is, okay, uh, I agree. It's difficult, if not probably impossible, to uh, really corral. Uh, faculty members and and treat them like okay this is not the appropriate behavior uh, but I certainly do think it's impactful if the president of a university stands up and actually says no this is unacceptable behavior where are our principles we're supposed to be not only teaching critical thinking which by definition you must hear differing views to understand what's wrong and right or determine what's wrong or right but also, it's really, again, the failure of sort of the, the moral or ethical role you have as a leader of students, as a mentor. Yeah. And I think this is the most, uh, honestly, uh, this was the the saddest tragedy of all to me on university campuses, is that I'm I'm fearful that we are churning out a generation of young people who think that the behavior of defaming, of intimidating, of harassing, of shouting down even, and mischaracterizing or distorting or whatever you want to use the word, if that is this is sort of learned behavior now from our university professors, I mean, this is really very, very sad and frightening because, okay, it sounds trite, but obviously these are the next leaders of, of this country, the yeah. students. I, you know, Scott, I agree completely. So there is a role, a role, a big role for leadership. And I think uh, my opinion is that the, the leaders of universities have not shown that leadership. In fact, they have, in, in many cases, been exactly the opposite and sort of caved into student demands, uh, not, not been strong about um you know, faculty violations of academic freedom. Um, so I absolutely think that that's, that's a problem that needs to be expressed repeatedly 
over and over and over again. I see that as actually the the first and foremost uh, duty of of the university leadership. Exactly, because it's so central to the academic mission. It's so central to the kind of discourse that needs to happen at universities and the teaching, as you point out. If if we're going to be able to teach students that are educated, critical thinkers, they need to be exposed to a wide variety of opinions, and they need to recognize that those opinions need to be given respect, but then refuted if, in fact, they're wrong. I mean, refuted rationally. Sure. Absolutely. And, you know, I think that Again, there's a nuance to all these concepts of free speech, but to me, free speech requires civil discourse. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I'm, I think we can be very obviously stating that we've lost a lot of civility toward each other. Uh, and I think this is sort of, uh, it's very sad. It's, 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 uh, it's a tragic uh, change, I think, in our, in our own culture uh, not just on campus, of course, but throughout society, is that there's a simple basic human decency in the way you treat people with respect has been lost. And I think uh, there's only one way to really change that. Uh, good people need to step up. And there are many good people. I think most people, are, frankly, are good people. We're just not used to having to confront these kinds of issues. Uh, so it would be very helpful if people in the leadership positions are actually going to, uh, you know, uh, earn their earn their salaries and step up and do that. You know, I, I wanted to, to ask about the students themselves to you. Uh, mm. You're still teaching on campus. And, um, you know, what 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 is going on with the students in your view lately? I, I feel like there is some backlash to this cancel culture that is affecting students also and of course students are younger they're more prone to being sensitive to things like their social network and i don't blame them for that and i'm concerned about them are are in your view uh is this is this getting worse or better in terms of our students able to speak up more or are they gathering a little bit more empowerment by one or two of them speaking up or how do you think this is going well, so it depends on what is the window you're asking about. I think that there was a sea change in the students. I know there was a sea change in the students that happened about, uh, I'd say maybe seven, eight years ago, nine years ago, um, that we, we were seeing now. So Jonathan Haidt has this view that, we're, that what was ha- going on is we were seeing the first generation of uh, the the to- I don't know totally online generation mm-hmm. and uh, a generation that had been raised on social media and whose primary interaction with each other was on social media and social media is not uh, well is is not a very um, polite place <laughs> let me put it that way I, I I've experienced it I know uh, and and I think. I, I can tell you that I saw it as provost. I saw the change in the students, and it was very, a very sharp change in in the st- in the type of students prior to 2015, 16, and then after after that. Um, so, got worse. That mm-hmm. that that was a problem. Is it getting better now? So you ask: Are we seeing a change? Are we seeing? The recognition that this cancel culture culture is, um, is is not something that we we want to pursue. You know, you hear people, you hear students who talk about it, uh, but I see evidence of it sort of ongoing as well. I I don't know that we're really seeing the end, at least yet. Uh, I, we're seeing some pushback, um, but. Yes, uh, initial stages. And it's at, at the initial stages. And I, I hope it's the initial stages and it will go on and grow. Mm-hmm. I think this is very important to, uh, as, as, a, as a sort of a side point on this, is that one of the points about speaking out or speaking up is that it does enable others to speak up. And I think this is very important 
a very important role of faculty members because there are students who need somebody else to go first or to say, yes, I agree with that person. Mm. Uh, and while it's, it's great when students themselves do it, uh, sometimes they need the faculty member. I've, I've had this myself. Ma many times students have come to me uh, and informally or at, at talks that I give. And so I think this is something that is undervalued, that, that mm. we, we're not just directly mentoring by our information. We're also showing people that, hey, you know, uh, courage uh, or independent thinking is important. And you're not the only one, you, you the student. Uh, there are other people that, that actually share your value or your opinion on these subjects. And I think if we, if we fail to encourage that among our faculty colleagues, uh, we're harming, again, the students uh, we're, we're, we're really, uh, we're dropping the ball there. I think it's very important. Uh, and it's not just students, Scott, because it also, when you speak up, I've, I've had people, I've had other faculty come and say, you know, thank you for saying that. I, oh yeah. I thought the same thing, but, um, so, so you do need to be a, well, if you're in the position to do that safely and with impunity, as I feel, you said that you felt you were because you're you're senior, you have tenure, and so forth and so. And I feel that way, uh, perhaps even more so because I've, you know, given my position. Uh, sure, people aren't going to cancel me, and so I can say things uh, without a lot of worry. Yeah, at least so far. Right. But that that doesn't explain though, uh, and it, it maybe it underscores the failure in people who are in those same positions, but they're still afraid to speak up. Uh, although you know, I I do have some sympathy for that or empathy because I, I it is difficult to be the tip of the spear, but uh, there's no question. But at some point, you know, uh, you have to say what's right, and when we we have responsibilities on campus. And I take that responsibility very, very seriously uh, that, uh, that students are looking at you both within your own university and all over, and I speak on other campuses, and um, it, it's very important. I think we, we sort of forget that. I think a lot of times it's easy to be self-centered and self-focused on what you believe, and you forget you actually, you're, you're in a position of, uh, of responsibility. And I think we need to take that responsibility very seriously, as I, as I know you always have. Uh, well, listen, John, I, I really appreciate your time. I don't want to take up more time of yours, but I would love to have you on again because I want to talk about what you're doing with the artificial intelligence world. I'm, I'm intrigued by the words human-centered. I think that's very important and relevant to what we were talking about. Yeah. And uh, there, there's so many issues going on, and as they will continue... Uh, not necessarily worsening, but these issues will continue. I'd love to have you back on. I think that'd be fun. Thank you, Scott. Thank you very much, John. Great, great to have you. Looking forward to next time. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Independent Truths with Scott Atlas. If you want to find out more about today's guest, Professor John Echemendi of Stanford University, please check out his Stanford Department of Philosophy website. And don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube, as well as Spotify, Apple, Google, and anywhere else you're listening to podcasts right now. And I'll see you next time.